Look, uh, now, understand this, that there, the, the real world is common law. Right. The fictional world is statutes. Right. You can do anything in fiction. Right. Okay? Right. And so they chose to do that extraordinary procedure, and the judge in this fictional statutory world right. has the discretion to uh, apply the codes in order to effect justice, whatever that means in his mind. Right. Okay, you grant him that kind of discretion, you get bad results. Right, but I did so, not grant him, and, and I recused him, but he still went on ahead and did it anyway. They went and got it signed. Let, let me tell you something. In your strategies, mm -hmm. what you should do when you find defects, learn from this. This, little, this is a good learning point. When you find a defect in the opposition, you need to use some strategy. I know, on the one hand, I've said failure to object means you agree. Right. But, on the other hand, don't educate the other side. Right. Don't tell them what's wrong so that they can fix it. <laughs> okay? It. So, in one sense, you, you, you've got to use a little strategy here. And, but if, if you don't make them correct it, if you don't tell them about it, you have to have an exit plan. In other words... If you don't tell them then, what are you going to do with that information? Because at some point, that's good information that would torpedo his case. But, but where's your strategy as to exactly when you're going to reveal it to them? Because you don't want to reveal it at a point where they have time to correct. You know, you, it might be nice to raise that point at the actual trial. Oh, Mike, during, during allocution, you could raise it. Yes. Go ahead, lady. <coughs> So when you do a motion, you only go into the hearing to discuss the issues in the motion, and if someone... No, not to discuss it, to answer the court's right. questions. You've okay. already discussed it in your paperwork. Okay, to answer the court's questions. If someone tries to bring up uh, new I facts, object. you just say, I object? That's right. That's it? Right. You don't even give a reason why? You just say, I object? Well, you, you give a reason if he asks you why. Why do you object? Mm -hmm. You say, well, that's not my wish. And you might even say something to the effect that uh, uh, it's not my wish that new information be allowed in. He had his chance. What are you doing? Trial by surprise? Is that the technique? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh-huh. Good. Thank you for bringing that in because, yeah, usually you object to new information. It's not allowed. They do it so all the time. Your phraseology makes it, puts it perfectly in the framework, mm -hmm. what you wish as well as what they want to hear. Right. But then you want, you see, what, if you do a counterclaim and you show up at the hearing you're, and you can, you can set the date of the counterclaim on the same date as that hearing, okay? Basically, the idea is, is that when you appear, you're not appearing as a defendant. You're challenging jurisdiction, so their case is suspended. So the only purpose of the hearing has to be to hear the, the counterclaim, something relating to counterclaim, and that puts you in charge then, and then you can make your wishes known. Excellent. In, in, in those situations in which you have, are a defendant, though, mm -hmm. uh, I usually find that judges don't bother to read the paperwork, and if you don't bring That's it up right. orally the, to point their attention to certain things, uh, they'll just slam dunk you. Well, that's true, but in this case, if you do a counterclaim and they fail to read it, who's in charge? And who's going to issue the order vacating his decision when he wasn't allowed to make a decision in your court? Okay. March 3rd, I was uh, uh, raided by the IRS. They took uh -huh. our records, took our sure. files, computers, everything. That's an excellent point. Now, those records are now contaminated. They're going to try and give those records back to you later. Okay? They did. They, 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 gave, uh, they gave back our computers, but not the records. That's fine. Because at some point, the, 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 the judge or whoever is going to demand that, like you file returns that you're refusing to refile or whatever. I don't know what the case was. But the point is, is that often they will say, we want you to produce some kind of filing report, whatever that. And when they do that, you say, I'd love to. If I could, but I lost control of the records, they were put in the hands of somebody who's an adversary, and I have absolutely no assurance that they're correct anymore. Okay. okay. But Bill, my question is, can, 
Well, tell them. Why don't you get up and say that? You're, you're under criminal investigation. If they, they will never ask you to produce records again. Right. Well, that's not true because I know people where it's done. They have asked for records. So my question is, how can I sue the IRS agent that, that, that did this? We just sue them. A state court? You could do it in a state court. In fact, that's an interesting technique. Remember that that the states and the federal government, each is a foreign entity relative to the other. Right. There are certain exceptions to that, but basically they're foreign entities. So one of the duties of the, of the governor, by the way, is to protect the citizens of the state from attack by a foreign entity, and that includes the federal government. Now, they won't do that, of course, because they're in bed with each other. Right. But basically, that's a duty, and you might be able to lean on that some way. But, but actually, I would say that you do your counterclaims, and, you know, they, and they now... Now, there's, there's been no, there's no, no action against me. I, what I want to do is an, yes, an action. Yes, there has been an action. They stole your records. Oh, okay. It's a theft. If there's no action, if there's no legal, uh, no court orders, that's a theft. Right. Do a counterclaim based on common law theft. Okay. And that would be, and theft, by the way, that would be a, uh, that would be a trespass. Okay. okay. A trespass under common law involves violence. False arrest, deprivation of rights, taking your materials, that's all violence. So they had a search warrant, but no probable cause affidavit attached to it. Yeah, that, that is theft. If it's not proper, it's theft. Okay. okay. Also, and I assume on that basis, do a counterclaim or do a claim since there's no action filed yet. Do an actual claim. Now, here's another interesting thing. Oh, one more. Uh, if you do your claim, if you do your claim before they've done any official action like that, you know, an actual complaint against you. Right. Now, as soon as they do some sort of a claim, whatever it may be you now can raise the issue of vindictive prosecution. Now, the thing about a vindictive prosecution, about a vindictive con prosecution claim, is that when you raise the issue of vindictive prosecution, that is the one issue that you do not have to prove. The burden of proof is on them to prove that the government is not vindictively prosecuting. That's an automatic. I have a question. Did you get their pocket commissions? No. Okay. Yeah. Maybe in discovery you can so request that, that, the pocket is that commissions. Is that all on the record here? Uh, are we recording that? Law, yeah. He's if I go tell them all, there, there is no discovery. <coughs> Who has the microphone? I do. do you, could you hand it to him when he answered? <coughs> no, I did not do, uh, I did not get their pocket commissions. And if I, if I file under uh, common law, there is no discovery. That's correct. You provide all the evidence that you have up front. Right. And there's no, no evidence, no discovery, because you have no more evidence to offer. Right. But yeah, I'd say, I'd claim uh, theft right up front. They took it without, you know, without the proper stuff. And then, uh, and then when they do come back with something, I'd claim vindictive prosecution. And the burden of proof is they actually have to prove it is not. I'm not sure how they prove a negative, but they have to prove it's not vindictive. Yes. A raid is also an unreasonable search and seizure. Why is that? Because it violates the Constitution. Well, wait a minute. Just because you put the label raid doesn't necessarily mean it's unlawful. I mean, if it's had proper warrant and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, wasn't that a proper warrant? Yeah, I know that, but he's, he's making a blanket statement that a raid is... They cannot raid you. They have to have a warrant. They just can't... A raid means... They what if they raid you with a warrant? Well, then it's not a raid. That's what they call it. Okay. You know, again, who's, who's running the definition of the words here? Okay. Well, any other questions? We're in the last hour. We're going to cut off at 9 o'clock on the recording. We can stay and talk a little more. But Okay. A couple questions here. Yeah. You want to, oh, all right. How can we turn um, a 23-member legal grand jury into a 25-member lawful grand jury? Well, that's that's not the subject of this seminar, and besides, I don't know. <laughs> however, however, my sense of it is is that 
the, all of the grand juries are statutory grand juries, not common law grand juries. If you want to know about a common law grand jury, read Article 61 of the Magna Carta. And I'm not sure, it's, I think it's Article 52, maybe 51 or 52 of, the, of Magna Carta also. But 61 lays out the procedure on how a grand jury is formed and what the pow powers of a grand jury are and what procedure should be followed when there's a uh, complaint against the uh, government. So, <clears throat> look that up. But basically, uh, uh, a, the grand juries presently are all, um, are all statutory grand juries, which means to me that they're not genuine grand juries. Plus, they don't have 25, which is the number specified in the... Um, in the, in the Magna Carta. So, <clears throat> I, I'd say that uh, if, the, if you want a real grand jury, follow the Magna Carta procedures, form your grand jury, but right there you have no credible power. Legally you're correct, but you're still not credible. So, I would suggest that the next step is before the grand jury did anything, that you go to the court administrator <clears throat> and ask for a room to meet in in the government building because if you go through the procedure and get an actual government spot to meet in there will be your credibility okay <clears throat> and and they, you may have to do battle you may have to sue them to get the space and so forth but once that issue is settled and you achieve credibility then you can start acting as a grand jury and then I would suggest that if you if you act as a grand jury under those conditions, that you pick small, obvious things. Just small stuff, obvious stuff, so that you build credibility. Otherwise, you can bet they're going to take the first opportunity they can to call you a kook, a whole collection of kooks, and, and undermine your credibility. Okay? Got a question? Next. Um, I had some funds in a private bank account, which mm -hmm. was commodity account sure. and if they took those funds the government took those funds <clears throat> because sure. they were in an account so is there a way they didn't sue me they didn't raid me but no, they you took sold. funds you're the injured party okay so I can still step absolutely. in there absolutely um, they got your funds they won't give them back to you right. right okay in fact as I recall in that case they actually misapplied the funds they admitted they got it they took it and they're using it for something else are we talking about the government or are we talking about the person that I had him invested with? Talk about the government that raided the person's accounts that was keeping them for you. Okay, yeah. Because I yeah. want to do a letter on that and go in as a counterclaim. Is that... No, you don't. You just do an original <laughs> claim. You go after them. Oh, I just do an original claim? <clears throat> sure. You're not, I... They're not attacking you. They're only stealing your property. Right. So I would go after the government. That is... Okay. Yeah. Thanks. You handed your money over to somebody in trust. That person got raided by the government and they took your property. Right, because they're acknowledging okay. it's my property. Right, right. and, and that's, that's the, all the better. Yeah. So now, and they're refusing to give it back. So we now have a cause of action. Right, okay. All right, Bill, regarding her question, would you then file a RICO against the uh, stockbroker that had her money as well as the uh, agents? No, I mean, the IRS? Uh, be real about this. You don't have to sue everybody in sight. Just sue the bad guys. The guy that got raided, it's not his fault he got raided. But he probably gave the money away without uh, due... No, we know this guy. He's a pretty good straight guy. Oh, I see. Okay. All right. We know. But you, uh, know, you don't just assume that just because, you know, you got harmed, you don't necessarily have to follow the chain that your money followed. You can go straight to the point of where the trouble started. Okay. Let them explain it. You know, let them explain why you shouldn't have your money back. No, okay, with regard to the, <laughs> since we're talking about the IRS, uh, as we, many of us here in this room know, uh, Joe Bannister about a month, six weeks ago, was sure. uh, arrested for uh, consulting as a CPA, right. telling people about the right. IRS not being legal, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. with employees. Now, uh, if you were uh, Joe Bannister, how would you respond to the IRS? Well, I don't know enough about his case, but the logical general answer is that you do a counterclaim. Mm -hmm. Because after all, look, all the cases, you know, 
there's details all the time, okay? You can get inundated with details in different cases. But the basic principles remain the same. Somebody done somebody wrong. So you sue. <laughs> okay? <coughs> That's all. Just sue them. Because they did a, and, and because you're at law, you're, or you're suing at law, you're, because you have that lawsuit going uh, in common law, and you're the sovereign, you decree what the law is. How did they harm you? And then the jury, if there is one, will decide the law and the facts. But if there's no jury, you decide whether or not they're guilty. It's I a do. system. <laughs> Bill, I have a friend who's in federal prison in Texarkana. Mm -hmm. He was put there because the uh, the um, Justice Department came after him for securities violations, which he didn't do. Mm -hmm. Is there any way to use this process to get him out of jail? If I'm if I'm the special a special master, and could I represent him? Or well, don't be anxious to be a special master, especially if he doesn't need it. All mm -hmm. he has to do is, you know, you can put the. I suppose what you could do is you could put the paperwork together for him. You know, have him sign it. You know, you just send it to him, mail it to him, he mails it back with a signature and file these papers for him. And if, if he runs interference, what you ought to do is get a seal because when you have the man's seal in possession and he acknowledges that's his seal, that becomes as good as a signature. You can sign papers for him if you seal it each time. I see. And hey, then he, his I, wife has power of attorney for him. Yeah, but that, no, this is different, oh. okay? You just get the seal. That's good. That's power of attorney enough. Okay. And then, but you put the seal on. And what I do is when, when I'm uh, doing a seal for someone else, I seal the papers with just by crimping the paper. But if it's an order, I put the gold on it and seal it. I see. Yes. Oh, no. Come on up. You can come up. They can't hear you when you're back there. Yes. He can put in a habeas corpus for his friend. You have to prove, prove it on the record. Well, that's true. If and so forth. Anybody can file a habeas corpus for anybody else. Any sovereign can come to the aid of another sovereign. Okay? When you're talking habeas corpus. So, you move for habeas corpus. You, these people answer or don't answer, whatever. You follow procedure. I like the procedure that is specified in... Uh, uh, title uh, 28, I believe it's 1441 and 1442. Is that it? Something like that. Habeas. Yeah, look in the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure. Look up habeas corpus. You'll find the section. But yeah, they have a very nice, clean procedure laid out. So you just follow that procedure. Okay. Very simple. It's about four or five paragraphs. And, uh, but anybody can file habeas corpus for anyone else. Okay? Well. Oh, okay, well, I can read off here. You have a question. We got another one coming up here. After you file a habeas corpus, how do you proceed to its end? It tells you in the procedure in that, that title. I don't have it memorized, but I know it's there. And then you issue yeah. the order for the judge to sign? Yeah. yeah. You could put together an order for a judge to sign. If he refuses to sign it, uh, what you can do is remember this, that when, when you put together your court, you hire various personnel to sit in your court. You know, the magistrate is there. You're hiring him not for his judicial capability. You're hiring him for his administrative capability. He's supposed to carry out the orders of your court. So he has basically an implied contract with you. That's his job. <clears throat> and he does it for free. Your court is not charged for the, for the, major, the uh, magistrate that's provided by the government. So the... Uh, uh, when, when you finally come to a conclusion, you present it to the magistrate for signature. If he refuses to sign it, and you have given him a proper order to sign it, then what you do is you go to his boss, all right, which would be the appellate court, 
since he's on the district court level probably, you go to the appellate court and the issue is not the habeas corpus at all. You already got to the judgment. The issue now becomes why isn't he fulfilling his contract? He has a duty to the court to obey the orders of the court and you want a mandamus ordering him to do it. That, that's what I would do. Or take it up to the Supreme Court. Because, and also, since he's a federal officer, you could also try complaining to the congressman, but not just a complaint. Ask the congressman to start a, content, uh, a uh, impeachment proceedings against the judge because of how he's behaving. Because the Congress can dump a judge any time. They just have to impeach him. It's not easy. They probably won't respond. But, you know, if you can, if you can make him look bad enough, they just might do that. I'll tell you this. No judge wants to have a request like that go in because, after all, his promotion <coughs> abilities... You know, he wants to rise up the ladder and if the Congress is considering impeachment, even if they turn it down, in the future it's going to look bad on his record. Um, got a suggestion here. It's something I'm not familiar with, but I've heard before. 21 silver dollars for court costs. And I'm, I don't understand the philosophy behind that or anything, but... Now, the Constitution, from what I know, the only time it talks about uh, at twenty dollars, and this is, appears to be a dollar more, is in the in the Seventh Amendment, which says that in, in, you know that a jury trial can be had in, in civil trials. But you know, uh, again, I don't know that. You know, that's what you can sue for. So you make sure you fall in that category. But of course, that was put together back in the days when. A dollar a day was a typical wage, wasn't it? So, of course, they haven't changed the Constitution. So, But anyway, you're getting into an area I don't understand. Somebody else will have to conduct that seminar. So, I only know certain basic things. So, um, okay. Huh? Remember my brother-in-law that came to the meeting? Uh, he went to make a police report. Mm -hmm. um, with regards to the off-duty police officer uh, that had admitted in court and part of the record and part of the transcript that he did take, that the off-duty police officer reached into the trunk of my brother-in-law's car and took a bag out of the car, mm -hmm. not knowing what was in the bag, so he did admit to taking it from his vehicle. So mm -hmm. my brother-in-law went to make the report to the, the police uh, the, in Norwalk, sure. and they refused. They sent, like, three times they came out to the house to take the report, but never, ever took the report and refused to take the report. Right. And then he reported it. Who's the, the agency that... Well, look, look, all a report does is put it on the record, their local police record, which then the district attorney can look at and decide whether or not to prosecute. That's all you're doing with a police report. It's but not like you're really doing anything against him. Okay, but they're refusing to take the report. Well, that's fine. You know, I'm, I'm just, they're obviously protecting their own. <coughs> but you don't have to put up with that. Okay? There's a real easy way to get a, a report going. It's called a lawsuit. <laughs> right? Put everything you would have put in the report, put it in your lawsuit and sue him. Now it's really public. He's been sued for misbehavior in office. Don't depend on the prosecutor to do it or the cops to do it. Okay. You know? They, I know I've been down that road where I, I reported somebody to uh, internal investigations of the LAPD. And, you know, they whitewash everything. I mean, I, I know that from personal experience. Other people have reported it. That's what happens. So... You can make it public if it's, if it's really serious enough. Sue them. That's what courts are for. Yes, ma'am. Well, when, when public officials fail to perform their duty, I think you ought to consider a writ of quo warranto to remove them from office. Well, that's true, too. And, and, and it would be interesting if you had a, a grand jury of 25 and issued an order to remove somebody from office because it is written in the California Code somewhere that a grand jury can remove someone from office. Mm -hmm. 
It's very interesting that uh, Bill Lockyer has put on his website, the state uh, uh, attorney general, uh, all these, uh, first of all, they're doing a, a whole reapportionment. Mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're also, he also put on the site uh, warning these public servants that they better act, start acting right. If you, if you go check the site out, it's very interesting. Oh, okay. Do yeah. You, do you, all right. So, what how, what is the chain that you would follow to get there? Do you have an idea, roughly, what it is? What to get where? To the website. To the oh, website to, oh, oh, to the website is it's uh it's attorney it's AG. Um, yeah, you get to the attorney general's website. Right. You click on. Oh, it's right there. It says uh, uh, you know um, it talks about um, you know, uh, Attorney General warns public servants to, to, uh, to you know. Is that just on the front page then? Yeah, it's right on the, it's right on oh. there. It's right on the, uh, right okay. on the side. Well, yeah. you know, look, uh, I have, I have maintained that not everybody in government is dishonest. That's right. There's a lot of good people there that do want the system to work. And they, but it, it's like, you know, many public officials have gone into government and have felt very frustrated because they couldn't change things for the better. Okay? So, it's like a, a ship. A big ship is headed somewhere, and if you want to change the course of the ship, a big ship, you can only change slowly. You cannot do a turnaround like a speedboat. And so, the, the ship of state is very similar to that. So, it's all of us pecking away at it. Remember this. You know, I've been asked this question or told, either way you want to look at it, you know, what's the point? We're not winning cases. A lot of us don't. We're not getting the results as advertised, okay? The courts are not functioning as advertised. Why do we do this? Well, for me, it's a certain degree of, of um, idealism. But here's, here's my point. It really doesn't matter in the bigger picture of things whether or not you win your case. On a personal level, it's very important that you win your case if you can. But in the bigger picture, it's not important. What is important is that we get a team out there all over the United States pressuring public officials to do their jobs right. And it adds up. If everybody did his part, which I realize is an idealistic statement, but if everybody did his part, we would have a very quick turnaround because public officials do not like having to hassle these attacks. Okay? When they do wrong, they like to do wrong and then forget it. But if you don't let them forget it, and then they have second thoughts about hurting the next guy. And, this, and, and it does have an effect. I mean, I remember, I have a perfect memory of 50 years ago. Okay? At that time, I was a, a, a middle teenager, but I had some awareness back then. And I remember somebody mentioning about getting rid of the IRS. And that was such an impossibility. You're not going to get rid of the IRS. You're not going to change the income tax system. That was, that was here forever. Now, what are they talking Even some very high-level people are talking about a national sales tax and getting rid of the income tax, right? That's right. Okay? That was an impossibility 50 years ago. Well, what's happened is the IRS has made such a bad reputation for itself, people have gone into the underground economy. The underground economy now, I think, is estimated to be bigger than the known economy. The uh, uh, people are refusing to file. Um, compliance is way down. And it's reflected in the fact that the IRS, despite the things you hear, is not getting the budget it needs. Okay? IRS used to... I remember 30, 40 years ago that IRS used to hire the top 10% of the graduating accountants out of college. And today, they're hiring the bottom 10% of those who will consider working for the IRS. A lot of will work for the IRS. Okay? So... The effect is there. It looks like a lot of times we think, boy, we're losing. But in, if you take a, a, a 25 or 50 year view, 